13th of July, 1941. Soviet DB-3s dropped their bombs over the Romanian city of Ploiesti and turned for home. The target was hidden by low cloud. But the high explosive had found its mark. Romania was Hitler's main source of oil. Now, just three weeks into the German invasion of the Soviet Union, this crucial supply line was under attack. The Unirea oil refinery burned for several days. The flames could be seen for many miles. Romanian oil facilities were hit again and again by bombers of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet, based in the Crimea. The Crimean Peninsula had barely been mentioned in German plans for the invasion, but now it was giving Hitler growing cause for concern. On the 23rd of July, 1941, Hitler issued Directive 33, which gave increased priority to the operations of Army Group South in Ukraine. On the 12th of August, he gave orders to occupy the Crimea, which, because of its air bases, he declared, posed a great threat to the Romanian oil-producing regions. The Soviet bomber crews had caught the attention of the Fuhrer. German forces were now heading south to deal with them. The first weeks of the war were disastrous for the Red Army. But in one arena, they had reason to feel more confident. The Soviet Black Sea Fleet was a force to be reckoned with. It included one battleship, five cruisers, 16 destroyers, and 44 submarines. There was no fleet to rival it in the Black Sea. It was commanded by the 42-year-old Vice Admiral Filip Otjebrisky. Otjebrisky joined the Russian Navy in 1917. An ardent communist, he'd gone as far as to change his name from Ivanov to Otjebrisky, meaning October, the month of the revolution. He'd commanded the Black Sea Fleet since 1939. In the summer of 1941, Stalin issued many orders forbidding units to surrender and demanding they hold their positions to the last man. Most had little effect, but at the Black Sea port of Odessa, it was a different story. The defense was led by the independent coastal army, which would soon be under the command of General Ivan Efimovich Petrov. Petrov began his military career as a private in the Red Army. By 1941, he was a major general, commanding the 25th Chapayevskaya Rifle Division, named after its legendary Civil War commander, Vasily Chapayev. Within weeks, Petrov would be promoted to command of the Independent Coastal Army at Odessa. The first battles for the city were fought on the 5th of August against the advancing 4th Romanian Army. The Romanian generals thought that Odessa would fall quickly. But Soviet soldiers and civilians had been put to work building new defenses. They had dug more than 100 miles of trenches and anti-tank ditches. Odessa would mount a stubborn defense, holding out for many weeks while it was kept supplied by the Black Sea Fleet. In September, Romanian troops broke into the city's suburbs and began shelling the harbor. Soviet Marines launched a fierce counterattack. Supported by amphibious landings behind the Romanian lines, they routed two enemy divisions. The siege lines were driven back more than 5,000 yards. As the coastal army prepared to carry the siege on into the winter, it received dramatic new orders. 
soldiers and their commanders who have fought for the city bravely and heroically shall be evacuated with all speed to the Crimea. Von Manstein's 11th Army had crossed the Dnieper and was about to cut off the entire Crimean Peninsula. Erich von Manstein came from a Prussian family with a long history of military service. He was seriously wounded in the opening stages of the First World War, but went on to become a highly experienced staff officer. In 1940, he devised the plan which led to the fall of France. He came to be regarded as one of the best generals of the war. Von Manstein was poised to break through Soviet defenses at Perekop, the gateway to the peninsula. The cities of the Crimea would be exposed, including the main Black Sea naval base at Sebastopol. To try to save Sebastopol, Odessa would be sacrificed. Leaving behind a small rearguard, approximately 90,000 soldiers were evacuated over the course of 17 days. They left leaflets addressed to the civilian population. We're leaving our beloved Odessa, but not for good and not for long. Those miserable killers, those fascist brats will be thrown out of our city. We will be back soon, comrades. At dawn on the 16th of October, the last ship left Odessa. That evening, the Romanians entered the city. German troops advanced through the Crimea, heading for Sebastopol. As they rested, shells suddenly started falling amongst them. Dozens of vehicles caught fire. They were under fire from the massive guns of Battery No. 30, dubbed by the Germans Fort Maxim Gorky 1. Batteries number 30 and 35 were the fulcrum of Sebastopol's defences. Each battery had two turrets, each with two 12-inch guns. They had originally been built for battleships and had a range of 26 miles. Construction of the batteries began in 1912, but because of the turmoil in Russia, they weren't completed until 1936. Electric engines were used to load and aim the guns. A light railway carried the half-ton shells from the magazine to the guns. Only the towers, protected by 400 millimeters of steel plate, were visible above ground. The rest of the battery was housed in an underground complex, 130 meters by 50. It included storage rooms for ammunition, electric generators, sleeping quarters, even kitchens and infirmaries. The battery was commanded by Major Grigory Alexander, as the Germans continued their advance, Soviet troops retreated south through the mountains, along the Yalta Highway, and to Sebastopol. Marines, supported by the heavy coastal guns, held up the German advance. They bought crucial time for reinforcements to reach Sebastopol. They included the Coastal Army under General Petrov and Fleet Commander Vice Admiral Ochebrisky. 
Sevastopol's defenses were divided into four zones. The first covered the harbor at Balaclava. The second, the highway to Yalta. The third, the central and eastern approaches. And the fourth, the road from Bakchisarai. Wounded soldiers and civilians were hurriedly evacuated by sea. On the 6th of November, the steamer Armenia left, bound for the Caucasus. In the chaos of the evacuation, many passengers were not entered on the ship's register. The next day at noon, she was attacked by a German torpedo bomber. The Armenia sank in just four minutes. From an estimated 7,000 passengers, an escort vessel picked up just eight survivors. Franz Halder, chief of the German general staff, recorded in his diary that the assault on Sebastopol would begin on the 8th of December and last no more than five days. But summer rains intervened to delay the assault. Von Manstein had decided to make his main attack against Sebastopol's north shore. At first sight, the Yalta Highway seemed more obvious. The open country on either side of the road was better suited to German tanks. That was why the Soviets were hastily fortifying the area. But von Manstein knew that if he took the North Shore, his artillery would dominate the harbor. With no more supplies arriving by sea, the city would be doomed. Realizing that Sevastopol could not hold out on its own, the Soviets planned to land troops at Kerch, on the eastern tip of the Crimea, and at Feodosia. The landings would be led by the elite 79th Naval Infantry Brigade. They would seize the ports and clear the way for the infantry that followed. Two days before the landings, the Germans began a brutal assault on Sevastopol. They made rapid advances. The Stavka High Command received an urgent message. Should further attacks be of the same pace, the Sevastopol garrison can hold out for no more than three days. Desperate measures were required. The 79th Brigade immediately boarded warships and set sail for Sevastopol. At Sevastopol, warships worked in 20-hour shifts, bombarding German positions from within the harbor. The Germans were finally halted at Fort Stalin. This was the name the Germans had given to a hilltop position held by the 365th anti-aircraft battery. It was not a real fort, although the position had some concrete emplacements for its four 76mm anti-aircraft guns. The Germans had nicknames for all the Sevastopol defenses. They included the GPU, the Cheka, Siberia or Molotov. Some of these defenses dated back to the Crimean War of the 1850s. Grigory Zamakovsky was at Fort Stalin. A detachment of sailors was formed to defend the battery, and I volunteered. We fought the German infantry right by the battery. Hand-to-hand -hand combat inside the barbed wire. It was cruel. Most of our detachment was killed. Such sacrifices brought Sevastopol time but the situation remained critical. The Germans could break through to the North Shore at any hour. It was where all reinforcements and ammunition were landed. To break the stranglehold, the Kerch landings would go ahead. 
Advanced detachments landed at Kerch on the 26th of December, but they were able to secure only a few small bridgeheads. Four days later, a risky nighttime landing was attempted at Feodosia. A Soviet submarine laid navigational buoys along the route. Then it turned on its searchlights to guide in the attacking force. A small raiding party led the way. They captured the lighthouse and switched it on. Now, the rest of the landing force steamed in. But one last obstacle remained, the boom that blocked the harbor entrance. Theodosia's boom was a floating barrier made of rafts. A Soviet submarine had made a nighttime reconnaissance of it just a few days before. It had been tightly shut. A boat was supposed to blow up the barrier, but its commander had suffered a failure of nerve. He was two hours late and then withdrew without orders. It was a dereliction of duty for which he would later be arrested and shot. The entire operation was in jeopardy. Only then was it discovered that the boom had somehow been left open. The first Soviet craft surged into the bay. The signal went up. The landing party stormed ashore. The German commander, Count von Sponeck, believed his forces were about to be cut off. He ordered a retreat. The Germans abandoned the Kerch Peninsula. For his decision, von Sponeck, a holder of the Knight's Cross, would be court-martialed and shot. The landings had exactly the effect the Soviets had hoped for. Von Manstein was forced to suspend his assault on Sebastopol. He even had to give up ground. He described the moment in his memoirs. It was perfectly clear that it was necessary to move troops from Sebastopol to the endangered areas. Any delay would be fatal. Von Manstein's 11th Army recaptured Feodosia on the 18th of January. The Soviets withdrew to a new defensive line across the Akmene Isthmus. The loss of Theodosia prompted the Stavka High Command to send its own representative to the Crimea. The man they chose was Army Commissioner Lev Mechlis. Usually the Stavka sent a senior general, but Mechlis was a pure party man, a fanatical Bolshevik with no military expertise. His presence undermined the front commander, General Koslov, and threatened chaos in the crucial days ahead. Over the Black Sea, nine German torpedo bombers began their attack run. The transport ship Svanetti was returning from Sevastopol. She carried wounded soldiers and refugees. Her skipper successfully dodged five torpedoes. But she couldn't escape them all. In 1941, in the Black Sea, the Germans sunk 23 Soviet ships and damaged 26 more. Luftwaffe air attacks were proving lethal. Most dangerous of all was Werner Baumbach, commander of KG-30. 
This was an elite bomber squadron that specialized in attacking ships and had recently transferred to the Black Sea from the Atlantic coast. Without adequate fighter protection, Soviet shipping was highly vulnerable. In just two months, German aircraft destroyed one third of the transport tonnage available to the Crimean Front. For the new year 1942, Hitler's main strategic objective was to capture the Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus. But first, he would have to eliminate Soviet resistance in the Crimea. Otherwise, his southern flank was exposed. Orders from the general staff stated, The main task of Army Group South is to recapture the Kerch Peninsula and take Sevastopol to free up forces for further advances. To achieve this, von Manstein was reinforced with the newly formed 22nd Panzer Division. He would also be supported by the 8th Air Corps, commanded by Wolfram von Richthofen. This unit was considered the best in the Luftwaffe when it came to close air support. The German offensive was codenamed Operation Bustard Hunt. Meanwhile, in the Kerch Peninsula, Soviet soldiers were digging a second and third line of trenches. The commander of the 44th Army had given orders to construct defenses in depth. But under pressure from Commissar Meckles, General Koslov put an end to such preparations. Instead, the men were told to prepare for the big advance. Neither Koslov nor Meckles were discouraged by earlier Red Army disasters. Their offensive was set for the 20th of May. Meanwhile, a Croatian Luftwaffe pilot had defected. He warned of an imminent German attack. General Koslov expected the attack to come along the main highway, where he'd positioned the 51st Army. Half his tanks were also dug in along this route. An advance along the Black Sea shore was considered unlikely, so only the weak 63rd Rifle Division covered this route. The German assault boats approached through an early morning mist. For a while, the landings were held up by Soviet engineers with flamethrowers but only until they ran out of fuel. Then, the barrage began. German artillery targeted the minefields in front of the Red Army positions. They blew lanes through them, through which infantry and assault guns could advance. Meanwhile, the 8th Air Corps pounded Soviet defenses from above. Once the Germans broke through the front line, they met almost no resistance. Kozlov had spared his men the trouble of digging. Now they had no protection on the open steppe. Chaos and panic soon took hold. On the second morning of the battle, von Manstein sent in the 22nd Panzer Division. He was, on a smaller scale, reenacting the plan of envelopment which had led to the fall of France. After breaking through to the Soviet rear, German tanks turned north, trapping the Soviet 47th Army. It seemed that the battle would be over in mere hours. But on the 9th of May, Soviet armor fought back led by the heavy KV tanks. Late at night, Kozlov and Meklis called Stalin. They proposed to withdraw to a new defensive line known as the Turkish Bank. But Stalin was not optimistic. 
If you manage to reach the Turkish bank in time, we'll consider that quite an achievement. Soviet units withdrew along the shore of the Sea of Azov, covered by their tanks. But the Germans were the first to reach the Turkish bank. They followed on the heels of a retreating Soviet column, hidden in the clouds of dust. The Germans launched an immediate assault and smashed through the line. Now, the Crimean front was ordered to retreat to the last positions around Kerch itself. In the open terrain, the Red Army was exposed to air attack. The losses were terrible. At the outskirts of Kerch, the Germans were briefly held up as T-26 light tanks made desperate counterattacks, The guns of the Black Sea Fleet joined in. But unlike Sevastopol, Kerch had no powerful coastal batteries. The Germans entered the city, driving Soviet survivors to the eastern tip of the peninsula. Their only hope now lay in evacuation by sea across the six-mile-wide Gulf of Taman. Every available boat or barge was pressed into service. Dunker's fleet, the soldiers called it. But here, there was to be no miracle of Dunkirk. In the face of a merciless German air onslaught, 120,000 troops got away. Many more did not. There weren't enough boats. Most of those who tried to swim for it were carried away by the current. As the Crimean front collapsed, Soviet casualties reached 160,000. The 6th of May, 1942. The German bombardment of Sebastopol was in its fifth day. A heavy shell had smashed through the roof of one of the turrets of Battery No. 30. It was soon repaired. But one gun remained out of action. Enormous shells were raining down from the German lines, two meters in length and weighing more than two tons. They came from two giant mortars, Thor and Odin. The 600 millimeter guns had been built to take on France's Maginot line. Now they had come to Sebastopol. Their shells could smash through three and a half meters of concrete or 450 millimeters of steel plate. The mortars took 10 minutes to reload. But the Germans had brought even bigger guns to Sebastopol. The railway gun Dora had a caliber of 800 millimeters and remains the largest gun ever to be used in action. It was manned by an artillery battalion of 500 men, which included transport units, gunners, a camouflage unit, and a field kitchen. Its firing position was prepared by 1,000 miners and 1,500 laborers. Assembly and preparation for firing took six weeks. Dora fired 48 shells during the siege. Only one hit was recorded. It destroyed an ammunition store 27 meters underground. Dora was in action for 13 days before being disassembled and sent to Leningrad. At that moment, 11th Army contained nearly 1,000 guns of all calibers. Von Manstein believed it was a record. 
In general, during the Second World War, Germany never used as much artillery as it did during the siege of Sebastopol. But as the siege went on, ammunition would become an increasing concern for both sides. For the defenders of Sevastopol, there was no place left to run. There weren't enough ships to evacuate the garrison. The orders were to hold out at all costs. There were few illusions about what this meant. An immense German bombardment began on the morning of the 7th of June, 1942. Thor and Odin fired 54 shells at battery number 30, but they failed to destroy the turrets. The Luftwaffe flew 1,400 sorties. The firepower seemed overwhelming. But the German infantry, advancing along the Belbeck River, were only able to advance a few hundred meters. It cost them dearly, more than 2,000 casualties. Witnesses described the whole horizon being alive with fire and smoke. The German onslaught was unsustainable. Von Richthofen's bombers were running low on bombs. His pilots had strict orders to make every one count. The artillery magazines were almost empty. Herr Oberst, die Kanonier berichten, die Munition für Büchsen, Karl, Gamma ist zu Ende. On the night of the 9th of June, General Petrov committed his reserve, the 345th Rifle Division. Supported by fire from batteries 30 and 35, they were able to stem the German advance. But four days later, disaster struck. As the transport ship Georgia arrived in the harbor, bringing reinforcements and ammunition, she was hit by two bombs. Massive explosions quickly sent her to the bottom. The loss of men and 500 tons of ammunition was a devastating blow. Vice Admiral Otjebriski signaled the Stavka. The shortage of men and ammunition puts us on the verge of catastrophe. On the 13th of June, Manstein was able to report the capture of Fort Stalin, which had held up the German assault the previous winter. It had not fallen until three of its four guns had been put out of action. Von Manstein convinced Hitler this was the crucial breakthrough. He persuaded Hitler to give him three more infantry regiments and not to redeploy the 8th Air Corps to Kharkov. The main German summer offensive towards Stalingrad and the Caucasus could not start until Sevastopol fell. Its garrison's bitter resistance was holding everything up. But step by step, the Germans were closing in. On the 17th of June, the Germans attempted to storm battery number 30. The minefields were destroyed by artillery and the infantry were able to reach the turrets. The gunners withdrew underground. They held out for four more days before battery commander Major Alexander gave orders to blow up the turrets and the generators. The next day, the Germans broke in and captured the survivors. Alexander and a few others escaped through a storm drain. But while dressed as a civilian, he was pointed out by a local collaborator. Major Alexander was taken to a prison in Simferopol, tortured 
and shot. The Germans had reached the North Shore. It meant no more supplies or reinforcements could be landed at the harbor. The cruiser Comintern, en route to Sebastopol, had to turn back. But at Kazacha, Kamishova, and Streletska Bay, submarines and small craft could still land. Douglas DC-3s of the Moscow Special Aviation Group were used to ferry out the wounded. Grigory Zamakovsky witnessed the scene. Thousands of wounded lay at the airfield. One aircraft could take just 25 people. A pilot would point to those that were to be taken. How many eyes looked at them with hope and pain. At most, the aircraft could bring in a few dozen tons of ammunition per day. But Sebastopol needed hundreds of tons per day. On the 26th of June, the submarine S-32 was en route to Sebastopol, carrying fuel and mortar shells. Southwest of Yalta, it was attacked by German aircraft. The explosion was seen 20 miles away. Soviet defenses in the north had collapsed, but the city was not about to surrender. In the south, the German 30th Corps was held up by Soviet defenses on the Sapun Heights. In his memoirs, Manstein indicated his main concern. The obvious way out of that situation was to redirect the main blow to the southern side. But redeploying an infantry division from the northern sector to the south would have taken many days, giving the enemy time to rest and reorganize. Once more, Manstein had lost von Richthofen's air corps, which had finally been redeployed north. Perhaps Sevastopol would make it after all. The sailors were building a jetty for large ships as fast as they could. It would be complete in just a few days. Reinforcements and ammunition could start to pour in once more. At 2 a.m. on the 29th of June, the Germans launched 130 assault boats from Sebastopol's north shore. Under cover of smoke and heavy artillery fire, they crossed the bay and landed on the southern shore. Suddenly, the Germans were behind Sebastopol's two remaining lines of defense. Von Manstein had caught the Soviets off guard. Crossing the bay had been considered too high risk. The same night, von Manstein launched an attack along the Yalta Highway over the Sapun Heights. These twin blows led to the total collapse of Soviet defenses. Small units fought on, but were increasingly isolated and short of ammunition. Stalin ordered key personnel to leave by plane. That evening, Vice Admiral Otjebriski left for the Caucasus with 232 others. Other senior officers made their escape by submarine. As they boarded, in full view of hundreds of soldiers and sailors, a riot looked likely. Shots were fired injuring a marine officer walking behind General Petrov. That night, the submarine left for the safety of Novorossiysk on the eastern shore of the Black Sea. Some commanders chose to stay with their men. Chief of Staff Kabaliuk of the Coast Guard declared that he would die with his unit. Colonel Mikhailov gave up his seat on the last plane, 
and was killed near Sebastopol. General Rupsov, commander of an NKVD border detachment, also remained and shot himself rather than be taken prisoner. General Petrov tried to shoot himself on board the submarine, but was prevented by those around him. Those left behind felt doomed and betrayed. As many as 80,000 men, many of them wounded, now faced death or the horrors of a German prisoner of war camp. But some refused to give up. They took to the last remaining boats or built rafts from whatever was at hand. One group of sailors built a raft from a truck and 12 inner tubes. Many rafts were sunk by German fire. But this one made it to the open sea. After a few hours, it was met by Soviet patrol boats heading for Sevastopol. After taking the survivors on board, the ships approached the coast. But heavy German fire meant they couldn't even get close. At dawn, the patrol boats picked up another boat carrying 12 more survivors. Then they turned back to Novorossiysk. Two years later, these soldiers would return to Sevastopol as victors. In May 1944, it would be German soldiers desperately building rafts, hoping to sail them to Romania. The Red Army would come to settle the score and exact a bloody revenge for the defeat of 1942.